Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for bearing with me. Uh, there was a problem. All right. Shall we begin with word of prayer? Uh, I think those who are not muted, can you please mute? Uh, because my voice is echoing. Okay. Right, shall we begin with the, with the word of prayer? Anyone can please be. Go ahead. Anybody can lead in prayer, please. Um, Father God, we thank you because we can bless you for this day. Father, we submit ourselves unto your loving hands, Lord. Help us to uh, help us to know what you're teaching us, Lord, and use it in our lives. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Okay, is there any reason why it's echoing? Anyone on mute? Guys, uh, is there is everyone on mute? Because it's echoing like for me. All right, uh, I, I don't know why that problem is coming. Okay, let's get into uh, today's class. So last week, we talked about the cross. Uh, we talked about Day of Atonement and how uh, the shadows of the cross, the how how the cross was fulfilled from the Old Testament, Old Testament and we see it fulfilled in the New. Uh, so we saw the seed of the wood, uh, the first clothing, Cain and Abel, and how the blood of Abel was calling out, uh, again, the shadow of the cross, and Abraham and his sacrifice. We looked at the Passover lamb, and when Moses came out of the desert, the rock which Moses struck, uh, again pointing to Jesus, and the rock which he spoke to, pointing to Jesus. And then we also looked at the Levitical offerings. So the Levitical offerings, every offering was pointing to Jesus Christ. But, uh, then we also looked at the Day of Atonement, that one day when the high priest will go into the Holy of Holies, take the blood of the of the ram or the, or the bull uh, and he would go into the holy of holies and he would pour out that blood on the altar as a remission of the sins of the entire nation of israel then we also look at the serpent in the wilderness right and how hold on just Okay, uh, so we looked at uh, the serpent in the wilderness and how that again pointed to Jesus Christ. Uh, finally, we also looked at uh, the one where a lot of verses, Bible verses, where he hangs on a tree fulfilling the prophecies, right? So uh, I'm sure each one of us are learning this, even in the Old Testament and Christology, we see that there are many portraits in of the Old Testament pointing to Jesus Christ. So if you read the book of Exodus, if you read the book of Leviticus, all those Levitical offerings, the sin offering, the guilt offering, the peace offering, the pain offering, all those offerings, and a lot of the things that they did in the Old Testament were all pointing to Jesus Christ, right? So we looked at that last week, shadows of the cross. Of course, you'll learn more in detail 
uh, in the course Christology. But now let's get into the next chapter, which is the cross in prophecy. Uh, we saw the shadows of the cross. We saw that the cross was already, you know, God had already planned it in the Old Testament. From the beginning of time, Jesus, when he came into this world, he knew that one day he will, you know, go to the cross. That's his final destination. He knew it. But let's look at the cross in prophecy. Uh, and the cross is mentioned also all through the Old Testament. Uh, let's read these verses. Now, I just uh, uh, I encourage each one of us, right? let's not waste time, and uh, because you know that this is recorded and it goes into the e-learning. So whenever there's dead air, it doesn't sound nice, right? So please you just begin to start reading. The moment I give the verse, uh, maybe one of you can please read, right? So it says here, Acts 13.33. Maybe one of us can please read Acts 13.33. Acts chapter 13 and verse 33. Yes, one of us can read, please. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second Psalm. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Yeah. So he says that uh, God has already appointed it. And he says that you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Right. Uh, let's see the next one. They divide my garments. Psalms 22, 16 through 18. It's there on your notes. Go ahead and read any one of us. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Right. So we see here in Psalms 22, which was hundreds of years before Jesus. Hundreds of years. David, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, is writing this. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Look at how accurate that prophecy is. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. Right? Now, uh, uh, we'll, we'll also talk about what the cross is, what happens physically. It was the most excruciating kind of death. You know, the word excruciating right, came from the word crucifixion. It's a it's a derived from that word, right? Uh, when you have certain a certain kind of pain and that pain is unbearable, it's called excruciating pain, right? It comes out from that word. So Jesus uh, was physically in excruciating pain, right? Uh, history says that you know when he was crucified, uh, he had already been beaten uh, with those forty lashes, and uh, the history says that the bones in his body could be seen. His blood was constantly dripping out, right? Uh, how do we also know this? Because when the soldier pierced his side, what happened? Blood and water came out. So there's, there's no more blood left. Every ounce of blood from Jesus' body was gone. What happens when blood is go, goes out of our body? Uh, the muscles tighten up and it tears. And so the bones can be seen, right? And verse 18, again, accurate prophecy. They divide my garments among them, and my clothing they cast lots. And did this happen? Yes. Remember the soldiers? What did they do? Hey, this is a fine uh, cloth. This is a fine material. We can take it. Instead of wasting it, we can you know, take it to the market and sell it. So they cast lots, right? Uh, okay among maybe three or four of you, four of us, let's see who will get this piece of cloth. And they cast lots for his clothes. Now this prophecy, 400 years, 500 odd years 
before Jesus Christ was born. How did this happen? Through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Right? Look at the next one. Again, very, very accurate prophecy. Not one of his bones is broken. Right? Let's read Psalms 34 and verse 20. It's there on your notes. Psalms 24 and verse... Go ahead. He guards all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Yes. So on the cross, we also know that, you know, Jesus, not, not even a bone was broken. Uh, usually, right, I think I've mentioned this before, during a time of crucifixion, what the Romans would do is, when a person is being crucified, uh, and sometimes, you know, they've, they've not been beaten, they've not been scourged, and all that. So this just crucified. So the death takes a longer time. Right, then you know what happened to Jesus because initially for Jesus it was let's let's you know uh, bruise him, let's beat him, give him those lashes and send him away. That's what Pilate wanted to do. Uh, and so they really beat him uh, and and they scourged his body. They used those you know those weapons that you know initially uh, you know the Romans what they would do is they would get these claws of birds. Right, and they would clip those tie those claws at the end of the ropes. Uh, so when you when they strike, the 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 claws will literally hang on to the skin, and they will pull out the skin. Right. So it was not just beating with a stick, but it was it was these tools that were used. Right. And here, people who are crucified, they would take time. Sometimes it would be four hours, five hours, because you know, it's a slow and a painful death. But what they would do is when there was when they wouldn't let the sun set, uh, and if the sun is setting and the man is on the cross is still alive, they would just break their bones so that that will facilitate facilitate a faster death. Uh, uh, but this is not what happened in Jesus's case, even before. They could break any bone. Jesus, uh, you know, looked up to the heavens and said, "Into thy hands I command my spirit." Now, what is that? Again, fulfilling prophecy. Now, did you ever think of this? When you go through the Old Testament, uh, when God initiated those sacrifices and the Levitical offerings, He tells something very interesting, right, to Moses. He says, uh, and to the people of Israel, He says, "When you take the lamb." Take a lamb without defect, right? Not a lamb which eyes is not, you know, one eye can't be seen, or a lamb that one hand is not moving, or a lamb that is, you know, usually what happens is they want to get rid of those, right? So I might as well give it for an offering. But geez, but God says, take a lamb without defect, right? A, a healthy lamb. Take that lamb without defect and offer that as a sacrifice. And when we see it in the New Testament, Right, the Lord Jesus was a was a was a lamb without defect, right? Uh, so that is why we see that this prophecy so small. Maybe it's not very important, but it you know it it directs it shows that this whole the the, the Holy Spirit speaking to the prophets of the old brought it in such accuracy of what is going to happen. Right. Uh, let's read this. There will be fierce witnesses. Uh, Psalms thirty-five and verse eleven. Let's read that. Psalms thirty-five and verse eleven. Fierce witnesses rise up. They ask me things that I do not know. Right. Thank you. Uh, now. Fierce witnesses rise up and they ask me things that I do not know. So when you look at the cross, right, and when you look at uh, what happened before the cross, what happened before the cross? So Jesus went to trial, right, uh, uh, and he stood, yeah, he stood in, in front of uh, high priests, Pharisees, and they asked him questions. Is it on 
sorry, uh, the light. Uh, right, uh, they asked him questions. Right, uh, who, who are you, and what are you doing? Right. Uh, why? Why is it that you are going and preaching about this? Why are you talking about this? Uh, why are you doing these miracles? Right? So they're asking him why, right? Uh, and fierce witnesses stood against him. Meaning what? When he stood in front of the people, uh, one, there were Pharisees and Sadducees who said, "Hey, he is uh, under the. Uh, he's he's a demonically possessed." Another person says, uh, he's out of his mind. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Another one says, uh, he's uh, a person who's you know, just uh, stirring up a crowd, just you know, doing all these miracles, but uh, he's stirring up a crowd. Right? Uh, now, fierce witnesses stood against him. And uh, all through, his whole, every time he was witnessing, there were fierce witnesses standing against him. Uh, let's read this. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The Lord Jesus took the shame on the cross, becoming as one who is cursed for us, so that we, you and I, can receive the full blessings of the cross. Right? The blessings of Abraham, that is righteousness by faith, friendship with God, victory over our enemies, and prosperity in the land. Right? We, we, we see that all of this uh, is something that the Lord Jesus did for us. Now, every time we think about the cross, every time we look at the cross, it is something that uh, should really encourage us and say, God, we thank you for what you have done for us. We thank you for the cross. Thank you for uh, you know, paying the price all through uh, from the Old Testament. The people were living in sin. People were living in, in that you know, uh, from from the time the people came out of Egypt, uh, we see that the people of Israel were going up and down. Uh, there was never a time, uh, you know, they were, I wouldn't say never a time, but during the time of David, there was uh, a season when they were truly worshipped, that they were truly uh, living a life uh, that was true to God. But there, again, there was no, there was no fullness that you and I have today. Right? Uh, but, Hebrews chapter 11 talks about you know, the heroes of faith. And all these people, you know, uh, Abraham, Daniel, Moses, Joseph, and uh, uh, you know, Hebrews 11 talks about that list of heroes of faith. And he says, all of them right, were of the old covenant. But now we are of the new covenant. Right? A covenant so great, a covenant so strong. Uh, 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9. Let's read that, please. Second Corinthians eight and nine. Let's go ahead. Second Corinthians chapter eight and verse nine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. So we can become rich because of what he did on the cross through his poverty. You know, we're not talking about uh, physical richness, right? You, we know that, right? We're talking about a spiritual aspect. Christ became sin for us so that we can become the righteousness of God. Christ became poor for us so that we can become rich in God. So there was this complete reversal, and the book of Romans talks about it very powerfully. It says, uh, the first Adam and the last Adam. The first Adam was tempted in all ways, but, he's, but he fell. 
but the last Adam again was tempted in all ways, yet he overcame. Right? It was the same enemy, it was the same kind of temptations. The first Adam was born of God, the second Adam was born of God, right? And we see those similarities, but the first Adam uh, caused a fall, but the second Adam reversed that fall. Right. Uh, Chira, did you raise your hand? Do you have any question? Chira, did you raise your hand? Hello. Yes, Pastor. Yes, go ahead, Chira. Yeah, Pastor. Just now you told uh, like Christ become poor for us to become us rich, right? Yes. In which uh, prospective you are telling like uh, Christ become poor for us, so we have to become rich? No, it's not we have to become rich, we are rich. Yeah, now, yeah. It, it's, it's not about, it's, that's what I was saying, Chira. It was, it, it, it was not about the physical richness. It's not about, uh, you know, uh, uh, getting more money. It's not about the money aspect, right? Now, Jesus became poor for us. Poor in what sense? There was a separation of God and, you know, Jesus is triune, right? He is part of the Trinity. Now, when he was on the cross, there was a separation, something that he did not understand, something that he, you know, he was, he was with God. John chapter 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? So what happened was, in this Trinity, on the cross, God imputed all the sins, and there was this brief separation, right? And that separation was being poor in the spirit, right? You know, uh, you, you say uh, when we say poor, we're not talking about the physical poorness. Right? He became poor for us so that we might become rich in the blessings of God. Right? He took up the sin, making him us, uh, uh, you know, making him the unrighteousness, but with that, we become the righteousness. Right? So it's basically, for example, somebody, uh, you know, we look at the whole aspect of uh, making atonement for, or the word atonement also means some substitution. Right? Making atonement for means somebody else is coming and taking our place where we had to be. So the whole aspect of, of talking about uh, the poor so that we can become rich was in the spiritual aspect, right? Uh, uh, of course, we're not looking at, okay, Jesus he took up our sins. It's not like he was saying, okay, now I'm separated from the Father. I'm not going to do, you know, I'm not going to be back. We know what happens, right? So Jesus says, uh, God, into your hands, I command my spirit, and he won the victory. Right, uh, but for that victory, he had to become poor. He had to take on that sin. Right, that's why he says, "Father, why have you forsaken me?" More than the the physical pain was the separation from this Trinity. Separation from the Father. It's like the Father saying, "Can't I can't do anything now because all the sins." Are upon you right now so you have to bear that sin and the judgment of God came on Jesus because of you know what was what was what Jesus did on the cross so he became poor on the cross now after that because of the victory you and I when we believe we will become rich in God the richness of his grace, the richness of his blessing, the richness of his power, of his anointing comes upon us. Right? Uh, Chira, I hope that uh, answers your question. Right? So it's not the, the not, it's not the physical richness, but it's yes. in the spirit. Yes, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. Uh, Nina John asks, can we also say 
he made himself of no reputation taking the form of a bond servant in this way he became for for us yeah very true yeah uh, so he took on what we were supposed to take on so on a in a broader sense that there's there's so many things that he took on the whole the whole aspect of the punishment that we had to be take on he took it up making him for but he did that so that we can become rich and we, when we read the book of romans romans 8 talks about the whole reversal so we can gain more understanding from that right uh, finally let's read uh, acts chapter 5 and verse 41 acts 5 and verse 41 So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Yeah. Now, this is after the Pentecost and the uh, apostles are baptized in the Holy Spirit. What does it say? Uh, can you read that again, please? Uh, Acts 5.41. Just read that again, please. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. They were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Now, imagine this, right? The Lord Jesus took up our shame. He could bear such a shame for us. Now, the apostles are glad that they have been chosen and been called worthy to take up shame for the name of Jesus Christ. Right now, uh, just picture this: these are the same apostles who were fearful and uh, you know worried about what their future holds. Now they're saying, "Hey, they went from the council glad because they were counted worthy to suffer shame for the sake of Jesus Christ." Now, how did that happen? Because they completely understood what happened on the cross. The cross was a place of shame. You know, uh, if you read about the cross, uh, history says that when a person is on the cross, right, uh, even a beggar on the road has more value than a person on the cross. In those days, lepers would be put away into another place, into another city. They wouldn't have the right to come into the city, right? Even if they do, they must cover themselves. And if people get to know, they would, they were, they would be stoned and beaten. But even the lepers had more value than a person who's dying on the cross. See how shameful that is. Right? If they had to choose between a leper and a person dying on a cross, they'll choose a leper. It was so shameful. If they uh, you know, if it was a choice between a, a, a beggar and a person dying on a cross, they would choose the beggar. Because on the cross, the person is no more a human being. They, they would, you know, the, the, his, the Roman history says that they would, you know, uh, fill buckets of, uh, you know, these uh, dirty, stinking, you know, the plain water. And they would throw it on them, on those who are on the cross, as a sign of saying, you are no longer a person. On the cross, the Roman way of crucifixion was that they were completely naked. It was not that they were wearing any garments. They were completely naked on the cross. Look at the shame. Jesus took out all of this shame for us. How much more must be we be willing to do something or face shame for his sake? I'm not saying that uh, you know we have to face shame. Of course, God has also given us authority. Uh, we are who we are. We are Christians. We live this life. Uh, what I'm trying to say is there will be places. Now, many of us are here in, in church and Bible college. Nobody is going to you know say, "Hey, you're a good." Nothing's going to happen. But what about in your workplace? You know, if we go to work, if we are in college, in a regular secular college, uh, some of us may 
plan to study or some of us in our in our neighborhood living around the neighborhood people may ridicule and mock at us hey these guys are Christians Sundays they only go to church you now they do something there they talk about the Holy Spirit they talk about this they talk about that they are always you know uh, they don't drink they don't smoke they uh, they don't know how to have fun uh, people will ridicule and mock it may be a shame for us but always remember you know when these things happen the enemy brings these thoughts and these enemies and the enemy says you know what why do you have to live in this shame why don't you go out do this do what everyone else are doing everyone are enjoying it. you have the right to enjoy you and i can look at the cross and say if the lord jesus has paid such a high price such a shame that he took up for us how much more should i be willing take up this little shame for his sake right uh, this way we are you know honoring the lord jesus we are honoring what he did on the cross you now uh, paul the apostle talks about it and he says if after becoming believers if we turn away from him and continue to sin there's no more sacrifice that is required i think more is done can be done like everything is is just going to be you know, our lives are going to just turn the other way basically he's saying if you've tasted the goodness of god if you've tasted what the lord jesus has done for you and you still push him away we, we still turn away there's nothing more that jesus can do because he's done everything else but we can only be expectant of a harsh judgment for our future so i just want to encourage us you know uh, even before we take a break remember that the lord jesus has paid a price each one of us you know we may be paying a price in small ways god may tell us to sacrifice few things in our life maybe sacrifice us, sacrifice our time uh, sacrifice our efforts give more into you know being with him his presence call us to sacrifice our response should he call yes i will do it because you did for me you paid the price for me and i was reading this book let's share this and then we'll take a break i'm reading this book and uh, such a wonderful book it was talking about the power of uh, the victory that jesus uh, did for us on the cross and he the writer mentions and he says even if there was if jesus has to do it all over again for one person living in this entire world now just picture this there is one person in the entire world who's that's living that one person is living in sin jesus would be willing to come back come as a baby live that whole life die on the cross again that same humiliating death for that one person can you can you imagine that picture that love that he has for us we thank god he doesn't have to do that he doesn't have to do that anymore because the price was paid once and for all so the writers in hebrew says the you know when he ascended he ascended on high and uh, and there is no other name on heaven and earth and at the name of jesus every knee shall bow every tongue will confess that he alone is god so that is such a powerful experience for us right when we look at uh, the cross in, in prophecy uh, you know in the book of hebrews they also say right at the lord jesus himself says it what the prophets wrote about they desire to see what you all are saying but the, the those who are there listening to it did not understand they said uh you know they didn't understand what was jesus talking about because for them jesus was just another man walking about uh when you read even the book of mark it's so wonderful because the pharisees in galilee were saying hey this jesus of nazareth we have seen him we've seen him as a young boy we've seen him 
you know, working, you'd seen him walking about here. How did he get this knowledge and this wisdom? One, two, and he's claiming he's the Messiah. That's a big claim to make. That's so why I think in Mark 4 it says, um, we know him. We know it was not like Jesus was hiding and suddenly from somewhere he came. No, we know him. He's the carpenter's son. And we know his brothers, we know his sisters, we know him, we've seen him. He's telling he's the Messiah. Oh, it was a big claim. They could not understand. Because they looked at it in the natural. The natural is Jesus. Jesus was saying what the prophets talked about, what they desire to see, you all are saying. They didn't understand. Probably the disciples also didn't understand, but they only understood it later. Right, so you and I have such a greater blessing right, that we can look to the cross anytime, wherever we are, you know, whatever place in life we are in. Right, we can always go back to the cross because the price was paid, he became a sacrifice for us. Right, uh, so we'll stop here, uh, guys. Uh, since there's a problem with uh, uh with the recording so I uh, what I thought was we will stop here just use this next hour to study yourself uh, and we'll come back next week and we will continue with chapter uh, in this chapter yeah we'll continue with this chapter uh, and then we we'll get into the chapter 11 Okay. Okay. Can somebody please close in prayer? Shall we close in prayer? Father God, thank you, Lord. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Father, you gave everything for us, Lord, so that we can live today in peace, Lord God Almighty. Father, the sacrifice that you have done for us. Father, we can't even imagine, Lord God Almighty. Father, you had us in your mind, Lord. Father, you loved us so much, Lord, that you gave everything away, Father God Almighty. Father, as we learn, Lord, your, from your word, Lord, and through these classes, whatever that you have taught us, help us, Lord, to remember that, Lord, to bring to our mind every moment of our lives, Lord, because you have redeemed us by your precious blood, Lord. Lord, Almighty God, help each of us, Lord. Each of us are so precious to you, Father God. And wherever that you have placed us, Lord, Father, in that place, help us to glorify you, Lord, by our thoughts, by our actions, but whatever, that is what we can pour out for you, Lord God Almighty. Help each of us, Lord, to be a powerful witness, Lord, in our thought, word, and deeds, Lord, so that we can serve you wholeheartedly, Lord, and be the person that you have called us to be. And always, Lord, be in connection with you. Father God, because only in you we have the victory, Lord. Help each of us to live the lives, Lord. In Jesus' mighty matchless name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Jacqueline. Thank you, guys. Sorry about all the glitches initially. Uh, hopefully, I can get that resolved and uh, next class we can uh, start off without any problems. Thank you so much. Uh, please use this next hour to just read and study and have a great week ahead. God bless.